uh, go through books of the Bible, and we're currently in the book of Mark, so you can open up to chapter 4 there, the last uh, 12 or so verses, uh, uh, 6 or so verses is what we'll be covering. Uh, we have a conviction that the entire scripture points to and tells us about Jesus. Can I get one amen on that? Amen. There we go. It is all about Jesus and... while this warms up. Are pastors ever wrong? You, you, you're muted. You, I can't hear you. I heard, a, I heard a no. There we go. I'm on. A miracle, because it was already on. So uh, anyway, back to the important stuff. We, we do have the conviction that the whole scripture is about Jesus, and we know Jesus in and through the gospel, that, that he came and revealed himself to us in order to, to make known God to us through the gospel. His life, death, and resurrection uh, is, is how God wants us to know him. So uh, we keep that central at all that we do here at Hope. We preach the gospel here. We send ourselves out to uh, 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 share the gospel with our friends. We gather in the middle of the week to uh, encourage each other in the gospel, recharge, and then resent out. And uh, we preach the gospel in the city. Whatever we do, it's all about getting the gospel uh, in us, of course. It needs to be in us because we're always forgetting, unlearning, uh, disregarding things that we've been taught. So we're getting it into our soul and then preaching it to other souls that they might be saved. But uh, in light of that, I'm just pressed to, to pray over the word before we start and also pray over those offerings that were generously given. Father God, we, we come here today with a thousand distractions or other things going on in our lives, but we come with great delight to focus on you today as you have made yourself known through the gospel of Jesus. And I pray that as we study your word and as we think over our own lives and as we uh, think forward to the week that will come, may you please give to us a, a, uh, a mind communal, uh, but also individual minds that are set on the gospel to remind ourselves that our sins are forgiven that our sins can be forgiven if they are not yet, uh, and that others' sins can be forgiven, that we should be open with this gospel for others, that they may be saved. And I pray, Lord, that if there are unbelievers with us today, that, and undoubtedly there are, those who maybe think they are Christians but are not, or those who are very well aware of their state before you, may you please press into them the need to believe in Christ, and would you give to them, as we've just heard, new hearts so that Jesus can set them free and they can believe for their salvation in Jesus Christ. For all the money that is given here physically and generously online, Lord, we trust that it will be used for this gospel proclamation. Please protect it uh, and, and uh, multiply it and use it for that. We trust you in your holy son's name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Well, the book of Mark has been an astounding journey so far. It has been Mark's aim, and, and remember this, when we go through Gospels, the, the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are all fairly similar. They tell a lot of similar stories. John is quite different. He's, he takes an entirely different approach. But what we want to ask, and we will today, as we come to stories, we want to not make quick and uh, shortcut easy applications to our life, but rather ask ourselves, why did Mark... And with his friend, Peter the Apostle, whose authority this book was written under, why did Mark include this story in this order, in this place in the book, with this emphasis? What is he trying to communicate? What we're going to see today is that Mark is communicating to the disciples or the rest of the crowd that was with him, at least in this portion, and to us today, and to the early Christians that Mark wrote to. He wants us to know that the Jesus who preaches about this great and glorious kingdom that he's establishing... This Jesus who claims to be king over a new kingdom, he is in himself God and he has the power and authority to do exactly what he has just promised last week, which is establish his kingdom. Uh, maybe you, if you grew up in Sunday school, you've, you've done this one. You learned uh, that you have maybe even some craft buried in a box underneath your bed with uh, some coloring in about this story. Well, we're going to dig into it today and see what God would have us learn. Hear now the word of the living God. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. 
and a great windstorm arose. And the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? May God bless the reading of his inerrant, perfect, authoritative word this morning. Amen. I know I didn't come into, I didn't want to come into a real energetic, happy, clappy church this morning. I know I came into a Reformed Baptist church. I know we don't pride ourselves on how loudly uh, we, we, or, or unsolemn we are, I know. But when I say that, we need an amen. May God bless the reading of his inerrant word this morning. Amen. That's what we believe. We at least believe that. So maybe I wasn't wrong. And I did turn it on. And the battery just popped out. <laughs> telling that one up is the one time I wasn't wrong about the microphone, or I was wrong. How's that sound? Are we good? All right, it says half battery, but we'll just, we'll just listen for if it conks out, we'll replace it, or I can use a, a handheld, or the handheld battery. Anyway, I'm not a problem solver, I'm a preacher, let's get into it. This morning, we, we're going to set the scene and the setting first, which is going to be, we're going to meet the storm, we're going to meet the disciples and meet Jesus all in their own circumstances, and then we are going to, uh, after looking at the, the fearful storm, we're going to look at the fearful accusation that the disciples make, and then we're going to look at the fearful confrontation down at the end of the passage. But first to get our setting right, and we've got to meet this storm, because this is no ordinary storm. I know that we're Queenslanders, and we pride ourselves in being in a pretty stormy state. We all have very high RACQ premiums, but in the Sea of Galilee, there were storms like we have never seen, particularly because they were so violent, with winds so quick, and, and occurred or started without warning. The Sea of Galilee is a freshwater lake. It's actually just a lake, but it's huge, so they called it the Sea of Galilee. And this is the area that Jesus did a high majority of his ministry on earth. His miracles, his preaching, most of the gospel accounts occur around uh, the Sea of Galilee. That's, that's sort of back in his, um, uh, his, his main neck of the woods of ministry. But around it, this is where he will tell uh, somebody to go. surrounded by not just ordinary mountains, but high, bowl-created mountains. So that at every point around the Sea of Galilee, you've got large mountains above it, and it is a very low-set lake. It's the lowest freshwater lake on the earth. And therefore what happens is there's, there's, a, there's a channel of rivers that feed into it, uh, but there's a channel of mountains alongside that river. Uh, and, and so as the wind picks up and, and it, it, it cascades down this channel of mountains, and in an instant, it, it erupts onto the Sea of Galilee and creates a tempest. So it's not simply a matter of reading the sky. Is there lightning? Do we hear thunder? Is it dark? No, we're fine. You need to know what the wind is doing hundreds of miles to your north to know whether or not there's going to be a storm. And so for this reason, the, 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 the wind... Uh, channels through those mountains and erupts onto the Sea of Galilee, often during the daytime when there's warm and cold air at play, but it can happen whenever. And it, it sort of whirlwinds in this bowl of the Sea of Galilee and make, makes it an extremely dangerous uh, lake or sea to go out upon. And in the middle of those storms, the, the waves can be quite high, and, and even after the wind dies, the, 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 the tides are just bouncing in through this bowl and take hours and hours to calm down. 
So we're there, okay? And, and this is a sea that is highly fruitful in fishing. This, the, the, the fish that was in the Sea of Galilee was, was exported all over um, the east, and it was an extremely plentiful area. This is how many Jews got rich, was, uh, you know, fishing and selling the fish from the area. And their boats were usually about probably the width of this, this sort of stage area that I'm standing on today. About, sorry, about the length of that, about two and a half meters long and about 1.3 meters tall. So not enormous uh, fishing vessels that we would be used to today, but sturdy and strong enough to be able to move quickly and withstand some of those storms. Many, many boats were sunk in the Sea of Galilee by the storms that came. Now, this is where we are. We're on this sea. And we're in this kind of storm, but on the boat with Jesus, as as he jumped into a boat, told the disciples, let's go over to the other side. We need a break. Leave the crowds behind. They make sail at night because nighttime there was usually less of these storms. And, of course, in the boat, uh, you've got at least 12 guys plus Jesus. Some of them were, you know, they were working the packs off, just like Levi. He had no fishing help or or, or sailing help at all. Uh, He had some some uh, carpenters, and maybe maybe some other blokes in there, but you had at least four very experienced fishermen. That is James, John, Peter, and Andrew. They they are on that boat. They've done this before, and and before they left, they sort of checked out the the ocean. Uh, Jesus said, let's go. They looked at it. They assessed, this will be all right. We've done storms before. We've done plenty of them before. But the storm that comes has even them Shaking in their sandals, speaking of perishing. You have four grown men. You know that, that when guys get together, you're never allowed to have an emotion or a fear. You're not allowed to. It's one of the rules of, I, I, it's in scripture somewhere. I haven't found it, but we all know when the guys are around each other, you're not allowed to show your fear. You've got a reputation. You, somebody's always trying to be alpha. Obviously, Peter would be in this situation trying to be the alpha dog, and yet they throw all of that aside. When this storm, and I'm trying to show to you that this is an astronomical, unusually powerful storm. When that comes, the disciples throw all of their experience overboard, they're fearing death, and they come shrieking, frantic to Jesus. This is the storm that we have hitting the boat today. This is the experience of the disciples. You'll see there in verse 37 uh, that they... Uh, the great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. So you have waves that are at least 1.3 meters tall and, and it's telling us that it's not just a swell. It's not just that the boat is, is rocking up and down on these swelling waves, but they are crashing waves. They have enough speed, momentum and weight that they are, that they are breaking over themselves and falling into the boat. That is a fearful midnight trip. And here are the disciples, worried for their life, it tells us when they, in verse 38, they tell Jesus that they're perishing. But I want you to realize that Mark is showing this, this story, explaining it this way, a great windstorm, because he's telling us some significant truths about Jesus today. He's put this this tremendous scene together for us. Twelve little humans in a rickety little boat. Jesus asleep in the back. We need to learn. What, however great and magnificent this storm is, we're going to learn something even more great about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 38. But he, Jesus, was in the stern. That's the back part of the boat. Maybe he was up the front, but he got rolled down there in the middle of his sleep. We don't know. But what we know is at this point, he is at the back of the boat, asleep on the cushion. Now, that is quite a a mean translation of the word cushion. It it just means headrest, which could have just been a plank that you usually put your head on. It could have just been uh, some kind of uh, uh, luggage thrown together. It's not, don't think, of your grandma's knitted, beautiful, soft cushion. He's not having a comfortable doze here. He's on planks His head is on something that a head fits on. That's all we know. And he is fast asleep. And they woke him. They, of course, they woke him. Of course, they're dying. They wake him. It's so stupid that you have to think that you have to wake somebody in that storm. But I want us to look at some similarities between Jesus 
and Jonah. Can you go back to the book of Jonah with me? In chapter 1, the book of Jonah. And you'll have some time because I'm using my new Bible and I don't yet know the, the separations off by heart. Found it. Not that much time. Jonah chapter 1. And we have another man, much like Jesus, sleeping in the boat. If you know the story of Jonah, he was a prophet called by God, sent by God way out to the east. He runs to the west because apparently God's not out there, jumps on a boat, gets into the boat and runs from the will of the Lord. Chapter 1 verse 4 tells us this. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea. He's out on the Mediterranean. Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee. But nonetheless, we see God sovereignly throwing at Jonah as if to get him as he's running away, this enormous storm that hits the ocean. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Then the mariners were afraid and each cried out to his God and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had laid down and was fast asleep. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the, perhaps the God will give us a thought and that we may not perish. What a similar scene to what we find with Jesus and the disciples. And yet in another way, a completely contrary scene. Completely contrary. We see that Jesus and Jonah were both in storms sent by God. Two storms sent by God. God is sovereign over all storms. We see that there are two men about to be shown for who they truly are. This, this Jonah is about to be shown for what he is, a rebellious running prophet. And Jesus is about to be shown for what he truly is, God in the flesh. We see that these two men are both asleep in the middle of a storm, but for very different reasons. Jonah is asleep because he had bashed his conscience tender and laid asleep on it. He did not care that he was outside of the will of God. He felt safe now away from God and so was falling asleep, completely unaware that God was coming for him. And he didn't care who else he put in harm's way. Jesus, however, was asleep, resting easy on the promises of God while his head is on a hard wooden board. Jonah was calm for all the wrong reasons. He was running from the will of God, ignoring that that would have consequences, and God was after him. But Jesus was calm for all the right reasons. He was dead center in the will of God, in the will of the Father who had sent him, doing exactly what he was commanded, and he was therefore confident, calm, and asleep. He had no fear to worry. And then we see the disciples... They were scared like Jonah should have been, but they shouldn't have been scared because they too were in the will of God, with God in them, in the boat. Let's just take a, a short little caveat application for us today from the life of Jesus. There is no safer place for you to be than in the dead center of the will of God revealed in the word for your life. Other opposition, political pressure, cultural uh, uh, opposition, whatever it's going to be, being there in the will of God is the safe space for you in this world. Everywhere else is danger. No matter how many trinkets or gold or glitter or temptation is dangled in front of you. Be found in the will of God. And you can sleep easy on the promises of God. But we're seeing here <clears throat> that Jesus is asleep. Now, I, we have to notice that this, on one hand, at the beginning of the passage, Mark is showing to us Jesus real and true humanity. I don't want to get anybody's hand up. I'm telling you that right now. But I think we've all yawned in the middle of a sermon. I know that for a fact. I'm up here. I think all of us have had a couple of eye uh, head nods, eye rolling dozes on a, on a sleepy Sunday morning. Okay, we should rebuke ourselves for that. But we're all human. And sometimes the baby's up all night. Sometimes uh, uh, there's, there's a leak in the plumbing. Sometimes we just couldn't get to sleep. Whatever. We're weary. We're human. Don't hold it against us. But Jesus himself knows the weariness and the fatigue of the human body. 
he doesn't just act asleep because he, he switched off his, 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 his mainframe, that, you know, the divine being puppeteering the human body, switched it off and started doing God stuff. He was joined in reality to a human body so that the divine presence on earth was weary, nodding off to sleep, and entirely fatigued in the back of this rocking ship, this rocking little boat. The Chalcedonian Creed tells us, in speaking about, written way back in the early church history, it tells us that Jesus was truly God and truly man. Not 50% of each, but truly God and truly man. Of a reasonable soul and body, meaning he had neurons that had to fire for him to think, and he had cells that needed oxygen and energy for him to work. If he didn't have those things, he wasn't thinking straight, he wasn't, he wasn't working. Jesus needed a body and mind in order just like you and I do. He was, the Chalcedonian Creed goes on, consubstantial or of the same essence as the Father according to his Godhead and consubstantial or of the same essence with us, according to the manhood. This is a, we just sung about it. Come behold this wondrous mystery. We can never get our heads around this. The divine person having with us and like us the exact same form and experience, yet without sin. He was tired. He'd been preaching all day to a huge crowd without amplification. He's preaching to 20,000 people, yelling, teaching, thinking, answering questions under spiritual attack, answering dumb questions from the disciples, walking around in the sun, and he finds a boat and says, let's just get some fresh air, I need a break, and is KO'd on the back of the boat. This is Jesus in his frailty. I, I, I don't know what it... One thing I was thinking this week was what it would look like to be entirely hungry and fatigued and never hungry. To be tired, fatigued, and never with sin. I've never seen it. I've never been there. I've no, don't try me when I'm hungry and tired, and I won't try you. We know that we arrive at sin there. But Jesus, in perfect patience, without sin, is at the back of the boat, and he's sleeping. Fatigued, but not sinful. Not cursed, but still tired. And one example that we're seeing here, or one reality is, as we've said, to be in the will of God is to be in the safest place, even in the midst of the storm. And that is us. For anyone who has been unified to Christ, pardoned of your sin, obeying his will for your life according to the word of God, if that's you, you're unified to Christ, pardoned of your sin, and seeking to obey his revealed will in Scripture. You, though life, family, enemies, politics, everything comes against you as a Christian, you are safe in the will of God. Or as safe as God wants you to be. Romans 8.31 says, If He, God, is for us, who can be against us? And Paul knew the answer to that question. Everybody can be against us. He doesn't mean no one can be against us. He means everybody can be, and it doesn't make a lick of difference to the will of God for you. The greatest storm the Sea of Galilee has ever seen, whip it up, throw it at us. We are here standing firm on the promises of God. If he is for us, who can be against us? And this is the mindset of Jesus. This is not the mindset of the disciples. Because as we look next at the fearful accusation, can you look at uh, the rest of verse 38 with me? You have to shudder as you, as you read this. Is my, is my microphone still going? No, where are we at? All good. I'll give this a try. Thank you for your patience. Verse 38 says... The rest of verse 38 says <clears throat> that they, in their speaking to Jesus, they say, Teacher, 
Do you not care that we are perishing? These guys are fearful and they are frantic. They are anxious. They're in fear of dying. And let, let us say, I think we can all amen this if you've been a Christian for longer than a month. The storms of life prove to you your true theology. You'll amen when we speak of the sovereignty of God, and you'll amen when you read that awesome part of the confession, and when you read Romans 8 and say, amen, death, tribulation, persecution, nothing can separate me from the love of God that is in Christ. And then we run or we scream, all like the disciples, we accuse God as soon as the storm picks up. The, the, the storms that come are similar to the tides that pull out. When the tide goes out, you see what was there in the shallows. And they're stuck there in the beach, squirming or, or, or half buried. That's our real theology. When, when the tide goes out, we see what is truly in our hearts and in our minds. When the storm comes, what's really in us and in our theology comes out. And these men who probably thought highly of their apostleship and their discipleship and their nearness to the true teacher, Jesus, they even call him teacher. Teacher, what are you doing? You don't care about our life. You're, you're perfectly happy for us to perish. We need to be careful for two things. When we are under pressure, when you and I are under uh, anxiety and, and under whatever pressures come through the storms of life, we need to be careful of two things. Number one, not to accuse our brothers and sisters who are more calm than us of being indifferent and less spiritual. If you had as much faith as me, you'd be stressed like I am. Your family would be falling apart. You'd be, you'd be shaking, and here you are, arms raised, reading the word, unshakable. You don't care. You're inhuman. But, friends, there are, obviously, that, that, that's possible. Sure, that, that can happen. We can be indifferent, uncaring, and untouched. All those around us may just be that rock-solid person that God has given to us in our life to lean upon, because... In another period of life, they'll be shaky, wavery, and needing somebody to lean upon. And it might just be you and the Holy Spirit within you. So let's not accuse those who seem more at peace of being, being less in any storm or, or less aware of the realities of life and Scripture. But secondly, and this far more importantly, let us be wary. Let us beware of ever allowing our storms, our anxieties, our cares, our problems of pushing us to the place of accusing God of negligence. This is the natural, normal, human response. Looking to God and asking something along the lines of, why me, or what are you doing, or at least answer to me and give me reasons. Now, these kind of mindsets accuse God, and, and we need to realize that unbelief does implicitly, if not explicitly, accuse God of negligence. Here they are, they're looking at Jesus, and they're like, you know, here's the guy. We, we don't have miracle power, Jesus. We can't be thrown into the ocean when our storm is broken up and just sort of float to the sea, still as, as float to the shore, still asleep, wake up, yawn, and then go healing some more people and not be touched by sickness. That's not us. This is not fair. You need to wake up and realize death means death for us. We're not super people. You don't care. Let us even see what is in the background of, the, of why they're waking him up is because, Jesus, you're not even willing to leave the comfort of your sleep to help us in our plight. And the reality as to why that is such a high act of treason and an unreasonable accusation is because here was Jesus not leaving the comfort of my... You think this is comfort? Head on a, on a thing of wood, back on the, on the boards, I'm wet. There's water in the boat. He's on the floor. You don't have to do much math to know he's, 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 he's covered in water. This is comfort, Jesus could have said. I'll tell you comfort. Comfort is sitting on a throne prepared by my Father. Comfort is being in a world untouched by storms and sickness and, and waves. Well, I never get fatigued, I never get sleepy or hungry, I never have to put up with dumb questions from any of the angels, and what I never have to put up with is angels coming to the foot of my throne, knocking, waking me up, and saying that I am negligent in my cares over them or of the world. That's comfort. 
And that's what I left for you. I'm here, aren't I? Jesus could say. I'm here on this earth, surrounded by sinners, storms, waves, and stench, and you're accusing me of not being willing to leave behind comfort to help you. Friends, the disciples are committing here a high act of accusatory treason against the king of the world. And here's Jesus, or here's me reminding us what is in Jesus' mind. Jesus' mind would mock, laugh, even giggle. The, the biblical word is, 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 to, is to mock them, hold in derision. Maybe that's in the back of Jesus' mind going, you disciples. <laughs> Dying on the Sea of Galilee, rotting in the ocean, blowing up in the salt water, and then popping as birds come and eat your rotting flesh. Not your biggest problem. Not your biggest problem. Also not why I came from heaven. Biggest problem, sin, death, eternity in hell under the wrath of God. If your minds were right, you would recognize your biggest problem, recognize the great solution to it, and be a lot less fearful in this petty little storm. I think that if we had our minds aligned to, to the, the greatest act of redemption that God has done for us in Christ, which is the gospel, we will, friends, we just will be so much less bothered by and complaining about and accusing God for doing wrong in the midst of our lesser problems. And, and, and when we think of who Jesus is, who God is, and what our greatest problem is of death, hell, and the wrath of God, then we realize that no matter how big your problem is in life, be the biggest storm on the Sea of Galilee. Could be the biggest financial crisis that has ever struck the world. Could be the the most tremendous sickness or family crisis. And it is always a drop in the ocean to God. It's always a tiny problem. If we have our minds set on the greatest act of redemption from God, we will complain much less about those smaller ones that that we find ourselves in. And, And before we keep going into application and understanding what, what's happening here, I need to make a, a little caveat that I hope will be very helpful. There is a little thing out there that making, wreaking havoc on the Christian world, or at least our witness in the Christian world, that is called prosperity theology or prosperity gospel. Really, the teaching is, and, and many people say, I don't believe in that, I just believe in X, Y, Z, and I'll show the, the exact same thing. If you believe that it is the will of God for every Christian to be, if they're in the will of God, healthy, physically and mentally, uh, wealthy and prospering, relationally healthy and prospering, if you believe that those things are the norm for the will of God, what we should expect, and without which we should look at ourselves what the problem is, you're sick, you're depressed, family's not going well, money isn't going well, you need to assess yourself, you're probably in sin, you're outside of the will of God, that's prosperity gospel, that's prosperity theology, it's come to God, get your problems fixed, and that's what he wants for you. That is not true, obviously, but, but more so, they'll come to this text and then start shortcutting, I think prosperity theology is just the art of making entire leaps and shortcuts in scripture. So they'll, they'll take a story like today. Jesus on the, on the storm, he speaks calm, and then everything's okay, the disciples live. Application, friends, what's the storm in your life? You got marriage problems, you got sickness, you got financial issues, you got employment troubles, whatever it is, Jesus is here, and he has given his authority even to you. Speak peace, speak calm, expect it, and God will bring peace to the storm. And that is both. That is, that is absolutely heretical because the men who watch this are not saved from every storm in their life. They, they are hunted down, killed, skinned alive, burned alive, and the rest. They know that the application here is not you won't face storms or even you won't make it out alive of every storm in your life. The great shortcut that they have made is to ignore the gospel implication and the reality of what we can learn today. I want to point out that to be biblical faithful means that yes, your greatest storm is done with, solved by Jesus, that being 
God's wrath, sin, and hell. By Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and then ascension to glory, he secured for us an unshakable rescue from God's wrath a freedom from our sinful natures and condemnation, and a spirit-filled eternal life starting whenever you believe. That's the good news of the great storm that has been defeated. It does not mean you don't face storms. It means that every, and it doesn't mean that every storm turns to peace and you're going to get out of it okay. One key to trust God in the smaller problems is to remember this. Our greater problem is solved in the gospel of Jesus. Romans 8, the very next verse from what we quoted earlier, Romans 8, 32 says, this is where we can make the connection between the gospel and then our daily lives and struggles and storms. It says, speaking of God, he who did not spare his own son, he didn't hold back even his own son, but gave him up for us. Will he not, with him, with Christ, give us all things? If God has been so willing to set in motion the the mission of salvation for us, to bring us securely to heaven as his people forever, if he has given his son to that end, will he let anything else get in the way? Even if you end this storm buried in the dirt six feet under. That makes no difference to his ultimate salvation mission purpose being accomplished through Christ. That makes no difference whether, whether the chemo doesn't work and you pass away or whether, whether the, the child never comes back or whether the employment never picks up. It makes no difference to where you are going because Christ has securely bought for you an eternal, unshakable redemption. And in that... Whatever storm you are in or suffering you're going through, you can know not that this won't get me, not that this won't hurt me, not that this won't happen. It'll happen, it'll hurt, you might die. Good news. Free from me. There you go. Put put it on a poster. It'll get you, you might even die. But if God has given Christ, and if God is the one who sends those storms, then I can rest secure in the promises of God, even sleep at the moment, knowing that this which has been sent from heaven, my sickness, my difficulty, whatever, has been sent by the same God, meaning it's sent with the same purpose as to why he sent Christ. Jesus came down to make you holy, to save you, and to bring you to heaven. And every difficulty in life that comes down is sent for the exact same purpose to make you holy, push you to Christ, and to bring you to God himself in heaven. You have never been left on your own in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the storm, and you are never being promised that the storm won't harm you, but only that it will push you towards Christ, to a more secure faith and holy life. So, there's another storm we can reference this morning, and that is the storm that struck a hymn writer's family. So he arrived safe over the ocean. Maybe you love the song, It Is Well With My Soul. The man who wrote this had lost his wife and child in a storm at sea. And he wrote in that song, Though Satan should buffet, that is, blow against, hit hard, like waves do to a giant English ship, though though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Now, we, we amen that, we sing that, but what is the connection? I'm going to die from the sickness, but Jesus died for my sins, but we're talking about his sickness. What is the connection? that this has also been died for. Your, your, your sufferings and afflictions have also been purchased by Jesus. They belong to him. They serve you. They are no longer your ultimate enemy. When, when suffering, sickness, difficulty, storms come, you say, bring it on. You've been sent with a purpose to make me like Jesus and I will submit to the will of God in which I am safe though the winds blow against me. 
This is the reality of every disciple. And so Jesus <clears throat> gets up and he's woken up. I hate being woken up mid-sleep. He doesn't take a swing. He doesn't rebuke even the disciples harshly. Verse 39 says, He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great Calm. This word great has been used a few times. The, the great windstorm which came and, 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 and brought a, a flurry of wind and waves like you've never seen. Well, now there's a great calm like you've never seen. What Mark wants us to see here is that there is no Thor, there is no Poseidon, there is no other semi-demi sub-god who controls different parts of the universe. The one God controls all things, and he was in Jesus. We said before that his weariness showed us his true humanity. Well, now, as the, that old creed goes on, and as this story continues, we see his true divinity. Truly God and truly man, says the, the creed. Truly God. The same essence as the Father. The same voice as the Father is spoken to those waves. The same voice which created them. The same voice which separated them from the land. The same voice which these waters knew from creation is speaking to them now. And, and what is amazing is that, I mean, it'd be one thing to stop the wind, sure, but he even just dissipates the energy into nowhere. He stops the roaring waters, which would usually keep going after the wind. In a moment, it turns to glass. And they're on some, some poster of, of a beautiful tourist destination, the Sea of Galilee. And the only ripples in the water is coming from their own boat. Jesus does that with just a few words. Only God only God can control nature like that. If you go to Psalm 65, verse 7, I'll, I'll read it if you don't get there in time. I'm only reading a couple of verses. But, but the mindset of the Jew, the mindset of the early centuries, the mindset should be still today, that to control the oceans is to be God. Verse 5 in Psalm 65 says, By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of salvation. You do awesome things, he's saying. The hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, the one who by his strength, this is speaking of God, established the mountains, being girded with might. And he stills the roaring of the seas and roaring of the waves, the tumult of the people, so that those who dwell at the ends of the earth are in awe of your signs. In other words, to the Jewish mind, to speak peace to a roaring ocean is the same power as moving mountains around because they're in your way. That is divine power. No matter, man can do many things, and we thank God for it. The, the 3D printing of a kidney, the cloning of a sheep. We do amazing things. We can harvest all sorts of things from space, sure, but we've never once been able to stop a storm that has been sent by God. The, the sheer power here is on a scale that, like we've seen Jesus in the book of Mark, cast out demons, rebuke sickness, make people well, and that's amazing and powerful, but sometimes humans just need a huge show to really drive home a point. And here is Jesus with a sheer display of, of absolute power in a moment, a storm apologizes and runs away leaving the Lord there on his boat. And I wonder what your response would be that day. Because it tells us that a great storm is turned into a great calm. And you may expect at this point a great calm to come upon the disciples. Tremendous. The, the problem is gone. We can now all fall asleep, row gently singing our sea shanties to the other side of the lake. That is is not the response of humans when they see and meet the power of God in Jesus Christ. We see that in their hearts, a great fear came upon them. Verse 41, they were filled with a great fear. Great like the storm was now inside of them. 
because they were not looking at winds and waves. They were looking at a holy, righteous, powerful God. They saw this explosion of power and then sort of deduced backwards and went, Jesus just then displayed more power than the storm, which we were very afraid of. Which means that all of that power was inside of him, just behind those eyes when we rebuked him for being negligent. Is this the same guy? Is this the same guy who was overhearing our bickering earlier? That power was right around us and we had the audacity to complain to think we didn't have enough bread, to, 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 to cry about the hot sun and all of this and, and speak it to him and then accuse him of sleeping when he has a job to do. That power was right there. You can understand why fear is coming upon them now. If one and one equals two, then sinner plus holy, powerful God equals absolute destruction. And he's here. There's no one else around. It's him in a bowl and God sending down something onto our heads right now this evening. They're shaking with fear more than the storm was, was striking fear is the power and holiness of an almighty God condensed to Jesus Christ looking at them. And what does he do? Does that power of God equal what they deserve? Does it meet out right then and there complete punishment for their one act of accusation? Or, or like you and me, let us have a boat experience this morning. And if you were to be looking at, or right now as the Spirit is here, we are in the presence of God the Son. And you're looking at Him, and you realize He has a perfect law that can be measured up against every one of the days you've lived, every conversation you've had online or in person, and you will realize very quickly the only thing holding back, the, the dam of God's wrath right now is God's own mercy and grace. And in an instant, it will swallow me up if God so wills it. But the ministry of Jesus, why he was sent to earth, he even says himself, I did not come to condemn the world, the sinners in the world, you and me, filthy in our talk, in our thoughts, in our, in our acts, before a holy God. He's not far away in heaven. He is among us today. But Jesus said he came not con to condemn the world, but that through him it might be saved. So what does Jesus say to them? Does he open his mouth and let fire from heaven consume them? No, he says to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And their confusion, their fear is arriving from this. Who then is this? That even the wind and the sea obey him. But the even greater question, which they will, will take quite a few more lessons to learn, is not just who is this that the seas obey him, that we're afraid of, but how is he not bringing justice upon us? How can he be with us telling us to have faith? Faith, which is believing God, surely would mean that we are certain of our death and penalty in hell. Let's just start there this morning. Do you have that amount of faith, like the demons have? God exists. You've sinned against him. There is eternal wrath awaiting every man, woman, child who has not been forgiven. And yet Jesus says, have faith. Have faith what? Have faith that the power of God has not been manifest in this world to destroy it. The power of God is not waiting, rubbing his hands together to smite down every little sinner who, who dares sin against him, but rather the power of God has been manifest in Jesus to consume the wrath of God so that sinners under that condemnation can be freed. The one thing that can save you from the wrath of God is God himself. It's been said many a time, you are saved from God, by God, for God. The power of God is for you this morning. If you are sitting in your sin, still unjustified, condemned, guilty conscience, the power of God can be manifest this morning to bring you out of that state, while you sit where you are, out of that state into a righteous standing with him. And if you're a Christian and you're in a right standing with him, the power of God is for you, Paul says in Romans 8. He's for us. That God is for for you, protecting you from anything that will destroy your salvation, protecting you from all of the temptations you cannot handle yet, 
protecting you from your own folly, the attack of the nations, and all the rest. You are safe in the purpose of God. Whatever other storms break apart the boat, we can rest easy on the sacrifice of Christ. Friends, he died for our sin. He rose for our life and justification. And if you simply stop giving up on yourself, if you, sorry, if you simply give up on yourself, stop trying to trust yourself for salvation. Imagine looking at a storm rolling over an ocean about to hit you with tidal waves and lightning. That is how hopeless and helpless you are to save yourself. See, if I'm speaking out a word, I've seen it done. Read one, do one. Cease. You'll be crushed. There is nothing we can do to stop God's punishment to us. There's nothing we can do to bring about our own salvation. You must simply trust in the work of Christ. You'll be safe, protected from, from, from all of the condemnation you deserve. Friends, trust in Jesus today. And if you know him, why we have so little faith? Let's pray. Father God, we know it is not enough to simply read and hear the truth of Scripture because as we heard in the confession, we are unable, we're not powerful enough to bring about eternal life. We're not powerful enough to resurrect our own soul to spiritual life. Just as Jesus was not able to be revived or resurrected by human power, having been driven into death, the deepest and darkest death that has ever been died, only God can bring about that resurrection. And today, Lord, some sinners are sitting here, listening, hearing this truth of Jesus, unable to save themselves. But would you, God, by your Spirit, awaken them and give them life? Bring them into our kingdom family. And God, I pray for all of us who have believed, who have been given your Holy Spirit, let us never think little about what you can do, let us never think little about your promises because they are backed by omnipotence, sovereignty, and authority. May you make us more holy, more trusting, and more joyful in the gospel. And we pray all of these things in the powerful name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen.